From the Selfish Path to Romance, download Chapter 1 for free at drkenner.com. So what's wrong? What is it? Is it bad? Real bad? Parents? Yeah. What did they do to you? They ignore me. Yeah. Now that's from The Breakfast Club. My parents ignore me. It feels so bad. It feels awful, horrible to have someone who's important in your life give you the silent treatment or ignore you or snub you, put their nose up at you or look down at you in disdain. How do you deal with that? Well, what if it's not your parents? What if it's your partner, your romantic partner, your husband, your wife, or a boyfriend, girlfriend who's ignoring you? What if your marriage has caused you to acquire a lot of gray hair. Well, one listener, Suzanne, feels her marriage is in the process of turning into a divorce. She wants to run away and not turn back. And it's been going on for three years. Now, what's going on? Is her husband drinking? Is he abusing her? Is he gambling? Is he cheating? Well, what if I said none of the above? The problem is he ignores her. He doesn't listen to her, and he constantly says, Oh, I forgot. Now, does he have a psychological disorder, forgetfulness disorder? Is he passive-aggressive, or is she a nag? I want you to be the judge. So here's one example that she gives us. Suzanne tells us, On Christmas morning, I opened up a gift for my husband, a sweater, and I thought it was very pretty, and I said, Oh, it's a small. I wear a medium. I'll exchange it for a medium. My husband argued with me on Christmas morning in front of the kids. He told me that I had seen a sweater earlier earlier in the week, and I told him I wore a small. Now, why would I ever tell him that when I know I don't wear a small and it would be no do me no good to get a small? But he persisted, and he said, You wear a small. I think I know my own size. Why couldn't he have just said, okay, we can exchange it? To argue with me on Christmas Day in front of the family made me very upset. It ruined our Christmas Day. Why did he have to go on like that? I think I know why. That's what she says. We will hear her reasoning later on in the show, and I'll answer her question. And the bigger picture is, he typically ignores her. Now, what if this guy, her husband, were to apologize to her? What constitutes a good apology? Think of the people in your life who have apologized and you felt, oh, that fits, that feels right. I I accept their apology. And what constitutes a bad apology? Well, what if he said, you know, honey, I'm sorry I made the last three years miserable. There, I apologize. Now get over it. Well, Dr. Janice Abrams Spring calls this the two-second apology. And she talks about many other types of bad apologies, what she calls cheap apologies. But even better, she talks about what a good apology consists of. So later in the hour, you'll hear about the sanitized apology, the grudging apology, and here's a good one, the guilt-inducing apology. And we'll contrast those with a good apology. And... I was I spoke with an older friend of mine the other day, actually yesterday. She has lung cancer, and she's had to wear an oxygen tank for years. It's gotten worse now, though. She has to sleep a lot. She doesn't have much energy. And this is a woman who's get up and go, always wanted to get up and go. I mean, she, she just was a real go-getter. My grandfather used to say, my get up and go no longer wants to. It got up and went. Uh, but she now now she says she feels depressed at times, and she's not that type of a person. There's not much the doctors can do about her lung cancer, though. So she has got to make the most of the lung capacity she has and the time she has left. To, she needs to figure out how to make her life as livable as possible, given her serious limitations. So think about it in your family. Do you have a family member who has a terminal illness, or it could be a coworker, or maybe you got some bad news? Later in the show, I'll be talking with Dr. Ed Martin about what the biggest fears are concerning a terminal illness. 
and how to deal with that type of news. I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner. I'm a clinical psychologist, and my show is The Rational Basis of Happiness, and you can call me anytime. My number is toll-free, 1-877-DR-KENNER. That's toll-free, 1-877-DR-KENNER, D-R-K-E-N-N-E-R. So think about something that's really tripping you up in life, really bothering you, eating away at you, whether it's in-laws or your family or friends or your co-workers or yourself, something that's stressing you out, pick up the phone now and give me a call. You can ask me any question you would ask a counselor or a therapist. Again, toll-free, one eight seven seven D R K E N N E R. And right now, let's turn to our After Hours line with a call from a 17-year-old teenager who feels depressed and at a loss. Now, what can he do about the way he's feeling? See if you think he would take any action. He did call me, but see if you think he would take any action beyond the phone call, and what advice would you give him? Um, yes. My name is Justin, and I'm depressed. I am only 17, and I drink and smoke. And I don't know, for some reason I'm depressed. I've had a hard life. Um... I don't know what's wrong with me. I just need help. Okay, he just drifted off like that. I don't know what's wrong with me. For some reason, I'm depressed. I've had a hard life. Now, the good stuff in this is, Justin, you made the effort to pick up the phone and make a phone call. This is a call for help. This is definitely a call for help, but you want to call a a clinical therapist in your area. I will give you some tips. You can call, uh, you can look up on the web, the Academy of CT.org. Uh, that's cognitive therapy. That's all one strong in one word and see if there's a therapist in your neck of the woods who does cognitive therapy. You're only 17 years old. You need to know something very important, a lifetime skill that most of us go to our grave never learning. We swim in our emotions and we don't know how to pause. And instead of saying, for some reason I'm depressed, to be able to say, well, what am I saying to myself? What are the reasons I'm depressed? And to know that depression means that you're dealing with a loss. Well, what are the losses in your life? You had a hard life. Does that mean that your parents were alcoholic, drug dealing, or um, they were just bums, they never worked a day in their life, or that you you don't you look real funny and the kids made fun of you from a young age. You have to figure out specifically what the problem is because you can never solve a problem until you can target in on the essence of it, the, the main reason. So you need to know how to decode your mood. If you're depressed, that means loss. You look for losses. If you're anxious, that means uncertainties. What is uncertain? You know you drink and you smoke, so that would be one step in getting better is to figure out how to change those. What are you trying to drown with the drinking? Um, and when we come back, I'll talk about this. And coming up, a woman who's partner has caused her to acquire a lot of gray hair, so she says, and we'll talk about cheap forgiveness too, and how to deal with bad news about your health. I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner. Here's an excerpt from The Selfish Path to Romance, the serious romance guidebook by clinical psychologist Dr. Ellen Kenner and co-author Dr. Edwin Locke, who's world famous for his theories in goal setting. Fitness which is obviously good for your health, affects appearance. Being fit makes you look and feel better, whether you do it by means of sports, going to the gym, dieting, or some other activity. You may enjoy engaging in fitness activities with your partner, though this isn't always feasible. And when you feel better about yourself, you wear more attractive clothes. You look more confident and pleasant. Your partner may find you increasingly sexy, and you may feel less self-conscious when it comes to romantic intimacy. You can download Chapter 1 for free by going to drkenner.com. And you can buy The Selfish Path to Romance at amazon.com. 